Come families, come friends, to a place that's grand. For fun and for thrills, visit Horrorland. With twists and turns and flips and spins, our rides are a riot, so strap yourself in. If your tummy is grumpy, please don't be shy. We've got oodles of tasty treats to try. So come for adventure and fantasy too. Your Horrorland friends will be waiting for you. I love scary stories, and of all the ones I encountered as a kid, one series stood out as my absolute favorite, Goosebumps Horrorland, a collection of novellas that I have tended to since I was in primary school. I'm fairly certain most of you are familiar with Goosebumps at the least, the classic 90s horror stories for kids written by R.L. Stein. He writes write the, the Goosebumps, Goosebumps books. books. And I did grow up on these as well, though I only read ones that caught my eye, so I'm not versed in every single one. Naturally, with its widespread popularity, Goosebumps went on to have many continuations, a live-action TV series, and then a full movie in the mid-2010s. But like I said, my favorite of them all was a little series that began in 2008 and expanded to something a bit bigger. You see, Horland wasn't just a return to form for Goosebumps, it was a celebration of the series as a whole. And while the concept of Goosebumps tales having canon crossovers was touched on barely in the past, as was the case with the series 2000 book Return to Horland, this new series was all about the crossover. Combine this with a three-arc series of books, two companion websites, and a video game release, and you can see how I might have gotten hooked. And for this autumn season, I wanted to talk about all of this and coalesce everything Horrorland that I know into one video. So come one, come all, visit Horrorland. The only admission you have to pay here is a like and subscribe. Tickets, please. Let's just start off with the books themselves. Goosebumps Horrorland is a 25 volume series split into three separate arcs with an additional Horrorland survival guide bringing the count up to 26. The main premise revolves around the horror theme park introduced in the original Goosebumps series and uses it as a common space to have characters and villains from multiple stories cross paths and collide. And since it's a bit relevant for what's to come, let's quickly review the original. One Day at Horrorland is the 16th book in the OG Goosebumps series. Lizzie and Luke Morris, their parents, and Luke's friend Clay end up at Horrorland while on vacation, where the scares all seem a bit too real and the entire place is run by what they think are people in big monster costumes called Horrors. They ride the Doom Slide, the Hall of Mirrors, the Bat Barn, and the Coffin Cruise, all of which terrify them half to death before trying to leave. The horrors stop them and inform them that they've been on monster TV all along, and are then tricked into a life or death obstacle course before being forced towards a goo pond. Just in time, however, Lizzie recalls the no pinching signs around the park and finds that horrors deflate when pinched. The group escapes on a bus, but finds that a horror followed them home to offer them free passes for next year. 6 out of 10, it's a classic Goosebumps tale that many, myself included, hold dear. There was also the series 2000 book Return to Horrorland, where Luke and Lizzie return to the park with some reporters to try and expose the place. I'm not going to really go into any sequels or spin-offs from the original entries in the series, since Horrorland kind of retcons certain stories and makes itself the true sequel. For example, even though The Haunted Mask 2 exists in the original series, the scream of The Haunted Mask appears to overwrite that plot as they both take place one year after the first Haunted Mask. It's like a case of all books are canon, but some are more canon than others. Now we can move on to the series. The first arc of Horrorland follows a very straightforward plot structure. 
The first portion of each book, and the vast majority of it, is your standard Goosebumps adventure. Then towards the end, there are a handful of chapters that make up the Enter Horland segment, where the main characters are invited to the park and have more scary adventures, which begins an overarching plotline to uncover the mystery behind what's really going on at Horland. And at the back, there was a fear file that contained documents and flyers from Horland, suggesting that someone was researching the park. The designs of the books were immaculate, incredible covers with wavy, bumpy cardboard, the first page being a flyer for an event within Horland, only to have the same flyer crumpled up on the reverse side of the page with the words Escape Horland scrawled across it. And on the back cover of the first 12 books, there were these half images of tokens that would match up with one another across each book and contained mirror writing around the edge of each coin. With the release of each book, there was also a re-release of an original Goosebumps book alongside it. For this arc, since it is the main Horrorland story, I want to do a full story summary from here. I'm going to try to keep the Goosebumps tales as quick as possible, just so we can get on to the continuing plot. I'll also throw in the jot notes I took on each story with a rating out of 10. And if it sounds weird that I'm mentioning the kids' ages, you'll catch on as to why I find it funny after about four books. All right. Strap in and enjoy the show. I like the classic scary story style opening. Graveyard at night, thunder, and lightning. Nice to start off with Stein's most infamous villain, Slappy the Dummy. Why are all the adults in this book such horrifically neglectful, ignorant, stupid assholes? It's so contrived. Ethan literally gets his kicks by kicking people. Put this kid down. Why does my book smell like Boston cream? 5 out of 10. Our main characters are Brittany Crosby and Molly Malloy, both 12. Cousin Ethan moves in with Brittany, brings his ventriloquist dummy Mr. Bad Boy along, and normal slappy chaos ensues. Slappy does bad stuff, Brittany gets blamed for it, and no one believes her. Brittany finds the six words to put Slappy to sleep in Molly's father's weird collection, Karu Marie Odonaloma Molinu Karano, but after using them on Slappy, she finds out that Ethan was actually just fucking with her all along with electronics in Slappy, and the words actually woke him up, which was a good twist, honestly. Then Slappy goes to dig up the Mind Stealer doll that Brittany and Molly were burying at the start of the book, and Brittany throws Slappy into the grave, smashing the Mind Stealer's case and causing the evil dummy's mind to be, well, stolen. The Crosbys and Molly are invited to Horrorland. As they arrive at the ticket booth, a horror scares Brittany by grabbing her around the throat before playing it off as a joke. Their screams get recorded, their luggage gets burned, and they take a fake cab ride to the hotel that goes way too long across Horrorland if the map is accurate. The cab fake crashes, giving them another scare. The family gets to the Stagger Inn, but before they can enter, they bump into a yellow-horned horror telling them to leave and find the other park. Inside the hotel, the parents and girls are given different rooms, with the girls getting the very special guest suite. Inside, they find tons of new clothes to try out, but no mirrors to view themselves with. When they go to find Brittany's parents, they've disappeared, and in their room, Brittany finds her father's digital camera, with a picture of Slappy on it. I did not remember anything of this book from when I was a kid, but now I like pirates, so it was a pleasant surprise. Billy has a very entertaining voice in how he tells the story. I forgot how much the pirate rhyme lived rent-free in my head as a kid. 7 out of 10. Billy Deep, 12, and his sister Sheena, 10, go on another summer vacation with their uncle, Dr. D. They go submarining to find the wreck of Captain Long Ben One-Legged Ship, the Scarlet Skull, which disappeared 200 years ago in a black cloud on the sea. While descending, the sub goes dark, and Dr. D disappears, just before the deeps crash into the shipwreck and awaken the zombie pirates. They are then chased around the sea and an island, with Billy using a piece of driftwood to support his injured leg, before running into two men named Goldie and Roger, who lie about helping them and just want the treasure, but it kills them. Captain Ben then arrives on his ship and demands his leg back, the driftwood. Billy spears him in the chest with it, the Scarlet Skull sinks again, and Dr. D returns to guide their ship back to the land of the living. 
Billy and Sheena bump into Brittany and Molly in the Stagger Inn lobby while on their way to the bottomless canoe ride. The four group up after meeting and are also frightened by a new picture of them and Slappy on Brittany's camera. At Quicksand Beach, all four sink in the sand and the deeps hear the pirate chant. Eventually, they go below the surface and find themselves flying through a chute. When they are let out at the end, Brittany and Molly are nowhere to be found. The deeps head to the playpen and see Matt Daniels from the next book using a gray key card to access and win all of the games. However, the monster police spots him and chase him down. Matt passes the key card to Billy and the deeps run back to stagger in. Billy notices a P on the card, but the rest is scratched off. They bump into Matt again there, where he explains a horror gave the card to him. They all go wandering around the park until they pass a cafe where they see Brittany and Molly sitting sadly at a table in front of a mirror. Using the key card to get inside the cafe, the girls have disappeared, but upon approaching the mirror, Sheena turns invisible. I really like Matt, probably my favorite character so far, reminds me of myself in middle school. But dear God is Brady not the biggest psychopath so far either. And the adults are, once again, complete assholes. Stein actually got me with the twist about the two guys. 6 out of 10. Matt Daniels, 12, again, athletic and smart, has a younger sister named Livy, 8, and an annoying neighbor, Bradley, 10, who steals his shit, pranks him with terrible stink bombs, and is just a general pain. After nearly getting Matt suspended from school just before his swim meet, Bradley orders monster blood online to grow bigger, but Matt confiscates it. Two men in black want Matt to return the product, but disappear before they can explain. The ooze gets on Matt's plant and makes it grow, and then Livy tries to trick Bradley into eating it by putting it in his cereal, which he switches with Matt's cereal. Matt begins growing and, while it helps him win the swim meet, keeps getting bigger, completely out of control. Returning home, he finds the men in black, who actually want the stink bomb, not the monster blood. In the end, Bradley checks the box it came in, and it turns out to be a six-hour sample of monster blood, and Matt shrinks back to normal size. On the day of the science fair, Bradley shows up with Matt's plant, which he stole and wins the fair, but the plant begins wrapping its vines around him. Matt just congratulates him and leaves Bradley to his fate. Unable to turn Sheena back to normal, the three ask for help from monster police officers Clem and Benson. They don't believe anything they say at first, but when the group mentions a mirror, the officers demand to be shown it. But the cafe has disappeared. The officers then take the group to Monster Police HQ and pat down Matt, that took me like three tries, I kept wanting to say Matt Pat, and Billy for the keycard, which Matt handed to Sheena to hide in her invisible fist. They escape from the HQ only to end up in Dr. Twisted's secret lab, where Billy accidentally unleashes some monster blood. As it attacks the deeps, the horror that gave Matt the keycard, Byron, shows up and sucks the monster blood into a pocket mirror, with Sheena disappearing as well. More officers arrive and arrest Byron, breaking the mirror in the process. One officer picks up the melting pieces of mirror before leaving, but Matt finds one piece left on the ground. Looking into it, he sees Brittany and Molly on a flaming carousel. The only saga I seem to have all the books for. It seems to be a retcon of Haunted Mask 2. Carly Beth is probably the best Goosebumps protag. 8 out of 10. Carly Beth Caldwell, 12, and Sabrina Mason, 12. One year after the events of The Haunted Mask, Carly Beth is repeatedly lured to the mask's hiding place, a lockbox in her basement, hearing it call out to her. She and Sabrina work with Laura at a farm part-time taking care of a kids program run by Mrs. Lange. Legend on the farm has it that years ago, a stable boy wore a mask so scary he frightened all of the horses to death but not before they stampeded and killed him. Carly Beth feels terrible about this being a horse lover. She runs into Clark, a boy hanging out in the stable, and then meets the shopkeeper again later that day. He won't take the mask back, warning her that someone wants it. Carly Beth then finds the mask missing from the lockbox. 
on Halloween at the kids' party, all of the children's paper bag masks start suffocating them at the hand of Laura, the actual ghost who scared the horses, who demands the haunted mask back as she cannot rest without it. Or so she claims. Sabrina admits to burying the mask on the property, but when Carly Beth retrieves it, she refuses to hand it over and instead dons the mask once more. Chasing Laura, Carly Beth sees the horse ghost send Laura off to the grave, and being surrounded by creatures she loves and whom love her, she is able to remove the mask once more, but not before it declares that it will see her again next Halloween. Carly Beth and Sabrina meet Billy and Matt in the haunted theater, where they are looking for Byron. During Mondo the Magical's act, Sheena reappears on stage. She claims that she was also at the carousel and saw the girls, but couldn't get to them before a door appeared that took her back. Going backstage, the group finds a flyer for the Wheel of Fire carousel and Byron's nameplate. Getting separated from the group, Carly Beth thinks she sees the haunted mask in a store window, but is mistaken, and then finds the masks of Brittany and Molly, which come to life, warning her that she's next. Hearing two horrors say that things are going to get scarier for the special guests, that two are already gone and they'll take care of the rest, the girls run into Wolfsbane Forest, only to be trapped behind a locked gate and have something jump from the bushes and land on them. So I am fully aware of the fact that I'm reviewing a scary book series for kids, but this was actually awful. Stein pulled the it was all a comic bit three times and all the characters are completely insufferable. Fucking terrible. Worst one so far. Two out of ten. Robbie Schwartz, age 12, goes camping with his family and Dr. Maniac, a character from his comics, appears. That was just a comic though. Robbie really goes camping with his family and Dr. Maniac appears. That was just a comic though. Robbie's brother Sam goes missing, and another character named the Purple Rage appears on TV. Robbie goes to find him, but has to escape when the Purple Rage turns on him. Making it home, he learns that his friend Brooke has also disappeared. He sees a comic strip of Dr. Maniac and the Scarlet Starlet gathering kids at a frozen swimming pool to skate forever, and he finds the place IRL. Captured and forced to skate, Robbie attacks Maniac and finds that it was his brother, and Brooke was the Scarlet Starlet all along. Before they can escape, Robbie goes to Maniac's computer, hits the delete key, and they vanish. But that was all a comic, though. Real Robbie made all these stories up, but sees the villains on his screen saying they'll meet again at Horrorland. Robbie trips over a branch in Wolfsbane Forest and lands on Sabrina and Carly Beth. They escape a pack of wolves when Robbie digs a hole under the fence for them to escape through. As they walk, the girls explain the situation to Robbie, but he feels compelled by some force to enter the game preserve. Inside, he finds a Dr. Maniac video game, and once he starts playing, he cannot stop. The gear literally won't come off. Almost on the brink of blacking out from him feeling the pain of the games for real, Brittany and Molly suddenly end up in the room with him, and they warn him that he needs to get all of the VSPs to the other park. They produce a shiny golden token that starts to suck Robbie into it, when Slappy appears and attacks them. Eventually, Robbie gets sucked through back to Horrorland, where Carly, Beth, and Sabrina have found him. On the floor, Robbie finds the golden token. This one was a treat, especially after the last one. Villains were defeated a little too easily, but the reveal that they were ancient beings with the cat disintegrating was very satisfying and sudden. I don't know what it is, but I really like the main characters in this one. Probably because Stein actually showed the reason they were being sent away, and that made me feel for them more. 7 out of 10. Abby Martin, 12 and her brother Peter, 10, are sent to live with their uncle Jonathan when their granny V has to go to the hospital for two weeks to have some tests done on her. At the train station, Crazy Annie warns them not to go to the house. Jonathan arrives and takes the children to his mansion, with bats circling the roof and loads of Egyptian artifacts inside, and a housekeeper named Sonia who keeps being creepy about Abby's straight black hair. 
On the first night, Abby sees the bats attack a man approaching the manor. A few days later, when Cleopatra the house cat scratches Abby, she sprays it with water, and the cat disintegrates into ash. Abby and Peter find their uncle opening mummies up and eating their organs. Running from the house, they are chased by the strange man and picked up by Crazy Annie, only to be delivered back to the manor. Jonathan explains that he is Tutan Ra, and that he, Annie, and Sonia are all ancient Egyptians who have lived on by eating mummy's organs, and a protein found in straight black hair. The strange man appears, revealing himself as the real Jonathan, and battle ensues in the house. Abby spits water onto Tutan Ra, causing him to fall apart, along with Annie and Sonia. This also sets the living mummy's spirits free. Returning home, Abby and Peter feed Granny V a mummy organ to keep her healthy. Abby goes alone to Horrorland and has a nightmare about mummies on her first night. Answering a knock on her door, she meets Michael Monroe from Book 7, worried about her screams. They become friends and start exploring the park, but the mummy's tummy game and the Annihilator ride scare Abby. Byron appears and gives them a note saying, Escape Horrorland, you are in danger, that gets confiscated by another horror named Cody. Back in her room, Abby gets another note saying for all VSPs to meet in Vampire Cafe. There, the group discusses what has happened so far, and Robbie shows off the golden token. The vampire hostess takes the token and swaps it for a fake, but before they can get it back, the VSPs are taken to another room with Cody, Bubba, and Ned for a meeting. Ned offers them fast pass tokens, essentially, and Byron hands them out. They all have icons of each VSP's scary adventure on them. Byron whispers to the group to meet at the Bat Barn at 4 o'clock. On the way there, Michael discovers tracking chips in the tokens, and everyone but Carly Beth and Sabrina give away their tokens. In the Bat Barn, they find a flyer for the Hall of Mirrors, but are then swarmed by bats. Probably the closest we've ever had to an anti-hero main character, Michael may now be my new favorite protagonist. I like how strange the story was, and it kept me intrigued for most of the runtime. The twist did not catch me this time, though. 8 out of 10. This book follows Michael Monster Monroe, also 12, and his friends Daisy and Dwayne. A tougher, rougher, angrier kid than most Goosebumps pro tags, Michael is buff but smart and hates his hyper-superstitious teacher, Mrs. Hardesty. After pranking her in class, she makes them pick through garbage, and as revenge, the group plans to leave a black cat in her house. Hearing a noise, Michael drops something in the basement, which was presented as in media res at the start of the book. Going up to the attic instead, they find a big egg and are forced to hide and wait when Hardesty returns home and starts sitting on the egg. Returning another day, Michael sees the egg hatch into a monster one of several that Hardesty, or rather the alien Zerborg Zerzus, is keeping in her basement. When Michael returns again for proof, Hardesty catches him and makes him eat some of the monster's cooked eggs, turning him into one and locking him in the basement. Daisy and Dwayne come to find the monsters, and Michael uses the dropped dog whistle to show that it is him. He finds a scrap of egg and half transforms back, before the three run into their kind principal, Mr. Wong, who is actually Commander Zanz. Hardesty and the other monsters arrive, and Michael attacks, breaking Wong's egg with him falling into it and throwing Hardesty in with him. They eat the yolk and are returned to the yolk, as are the other monsters. Michael eats some yolk and is fully restored to human form. At home, Michael eats a slice of cake that was revealed to have been made by Hardesty with her special eggs. Using the lucky dog whistle, Michael chases off the bats and everyone escapes. An argument ensues between Matt and Michael, and when they start fighting, the monster police tries to break them up. The VSPs scatter and regroup at Stagger Inn, where everyone explains the full story to Michael. While everyone else wants to find Byron, and he doesn't want to fight over leadership with Matt, Michael goes off to find a mirror, but can't. 
Instead, he sneaks into a restricted building that leads to some underground maintenance tunnels, but is chased off by an MP officer. Taking the group back there, they finally manage to connect to the internet and do some research. Horrorland was originally built in the mid-1970s by Kit Katzman, who hired strange-looking workers called Horrors to run the park. Searching for Panic Park, they find out that it was another amusement park built in the 1950s by a secretive man named Karloff Menace, and how the Wheel of Fire was one of its most popular attractions. As they find a blog run by two people named Luke and Lizzie, alarms ring out, and the group is chased into a room of caged gorillas by the MP. Michael uses Matt's keycard to open the cages, causing enough of a distraction for the party to flee. They take a ladder up to Goodbye Land, but when Michael goes through a hedge, he is grabbed by Clem and Benson before an unknown horror, Byron, based on the description, shows Michael a mirror and sends him to Panic Park. While some parts were as predictable as I expected of a Say Cheese and Die spinoff, other parts were actually done really well. The bad moments created by the camera were surprisingly creative. David should be locked up. 7 out of 10. Julie Martin, 12, proposes an idea for the swimming team yearbook photo from the top of the diving board. And at David's arrogant prompting, Mr. Webb turns it into a contest reward. While out with her friend Rena, Julie finds an old camera at a yard sale. The mother there tells her not to touch it, but the daughter gives it to her anyways. Julie takes a picture of Rena, which gives her literal red eye that burns. At a basketball game, Julie snaps home player Carla, and her arm gets caught in the hoop and breaks gruesomely. David snatches the camera away and takes Julie's picture. When the photo gets stuck, Julie feels her midsection tightening painfully. She manages to remove the photo before she passes out. Julie tries to return the camera, but the family moved away, so she leaves it in the empty house, only for it to return home. So she throws it in a pond, and it returns again. Julie takes it to David's father's camera shop and learns that it came from a 50s horror movie set where things went wrong and leaves the camera in his possession. At a school play, David shows up with the camera, revealing he was the one returning the camera to her and stalking her, and snaps Bretta and Greta, giving them snake skin. Julie takes it back home and her brother Sammy gets his head turned into a bee from a pick, while Julie's picture shows her falling. At the swimming picture, Julie lets David go up, but when he almost falls in, she goes to save him. She nearly falls too, but David saves her. With the curse broken, everyone returns to normal, and Julie tries to destroy the camera by making it snap itself in a mirror, only to create another copy of the camera. Julie is taking pictures around Horrorland when she snaps Madame Doom, an automated fortune teller booth, and Slappy appears in the pictures. She then sees the gorilla creatures burst from a sewer grate, and Horror is pushing them back under. A Horror takes the memory card from her camera and tosses it away, just before she meets the VSPs. She tries to follow them as they run from MP, but ends up in the Tunnel of Screams. After a terrible experience there, she runs into Byron, who gives her a mirror wrapped up in a Panic Park ad paper, and warns her about the Keeper. She doesn't like the pulling feeling of the mirror and tosses it away. Bumping back into the VSPs and learning about Panic Park and mirrors, they run back to the trash can, only to find it being lifted into a truck and destroyed. Then they decide to try and leave out the front gate. A horror stops them, only to stamp their hands. But as they exit, the stamps begin to itch and have large purple tendrils come out, caging the VSPs together. Pretty much exactly as I expected. Nothing too crazy here. 5 out of 10. Boone Dixon, 12, and his sister Heather are going to a summer camp called Camp Heather. On the bus ride, Boone meets Roddy, who tells him weird stories about the camp, including how Serpo the giant snake sleeps under the lake and eats kids as they swim across it. Heather scares Boone on the ride with her rattling bracelet. Arriving at the camp, they meet Dr. Crawler, and Boone, Roddy, and two other boys join Counselor Nathan in the Cottonmouth Cabin. Visiting the camp nurse, the boys are instructed to apply a supposed sunscreen spray called Sun Glow twice a day. The kids keep hearing a loud hissing sound, but none of the staff acknowledge it. 
Roddy doesn't like it at the camp and suddenly disappears with the counselors collecting his belongings and saying he went home. Sneaking out at night, Boone and Heather find a cabin filled with mice and the counselor cabin has snakes in their beds that chase them. The next morning, learning that an Uncle Jerry is the actual head counselor, Boone and Heather go into Crawler's office and find that Jerry and Crawler are scientists who accidentally turn themselves into snakes along with the staff. They get the campers to spray themselves in snake DNA so they can try transforming them to snakes and back to save themselves. The snakes take them to another cabin where the hissing comes from machines and Roddy is turned into a king snake. Boone throws Roddy at Crawler when Heather distracts them with her bracelet and Crawler bites himself, dying to his own venom. The other snakes flee, and Roddy is returned to normal. On the way home, Boone gives Heather a talking garden snake. Boone arrives in Horrorland, only to run into the VSPs entangled in the purple vines. As he tries to save them, Ned arrives with backup and calms the vines with a humming device. He forces everyone onto a bus to visit the Keeper, Boone included. On the ride, Boone claims there's a snake on the bus after overhearing the horrors were scared of them, and they all flee, leaving the kids to escape. Finding their way to Goodbye Land, they ride the Ripper Dipper into the depths of Horrorland, only to find Ned waiting for them again. They are taken to a back room in Mondo's magic shop, then down underground to a colorful room with many signs of their past villains following them to Horrorland. Then, Dr. Maniac appears as the Keeper and starts torturing the kids, with the Purple Rage teaming up with him and grabbing Boone by the throat, ready to twist him like a balloon animal. Other than the best scare in the series so far and the constant inclusion of Madame Doom, the rest of the book is very mediocre for a Goosebumps adventure. 4 out of 10. Jillian and Jackson Gerard are 12 year old twins. After being kicked out of the movies for fighting with another pair of annoying clumsy twins named Nina and Artie, the twins find a Madame Doom booth outside of the theater. As they reach into the window to take her card, with Jillian pushing Jackson, they both suffer an electrical shock. The card reads, Welcome to Horrorland. The next day, the two begin to discover that they have developed strange powers. Jackson has telekinesis, and Jillian can read minds. After messing around with their powers for a while, in one attempt nearly freezing the other twins permanently, they are approached by an ancient man named Finney, who teleports them to a place called the Institute. There, an inspector cranium explains that the Institute detects people with special powers and tests them. The twins are subjected to a painful test, where they try to trick the system by only thinking of Nina and Artie. When the test supposedly fails, Cranium gives them a business card and sends them home. The card reads, You didn't fool me. After Artie and Nina's birthday, Cranium bursts in to detain them, not Jillian or Jackson, claiming that the Thought Police do not allow just anyone to keep their powers. The other two reveal their own stronger powers, and Artie turns Cranium into an infant. The other two move away, and Jillian and Jackson find another Madame Doom booth, where her card reads once more, Welcome to Horrorland. Visiting Horrorland to find some answers about their powers, the twins come across another Madame Doom who gives them a new fortune, Escape Horrorland. Shortly after, they run into Cranium again, restored as an adult. Jackson levitates Madame Doom and drops it on Cranium, giving them a chance to run. As Cranium screams that they can't escape the menace, the twins go down the Doom Slide, only to be caught by horrors at the bottom. While being led to the Keeper's lair, Jillian spots a boy and girl spying on them from behind a corner. In the Keeper's lair, Jackson drops a chandelier on the Purple Rage, making him so angry he explodes. Dr. Maniac continues the torture by pushing the temperature into extremes, causing Robbie to die, and Jillian protesting that Maniac killed him, since she read his mind and is playing along. This sends Maniac into a panic, claiming the menace will kill him for this, which none of the kids recognize, before he flees. Robbie gets up, and the group escapes the room, running back to the place where the cafe was. 
Jackson opens the brick wall to reveal the hidden cafe, and Nat's keycard gains them entry. Five of the kids get through the mirror, while six get stuck behind when the mirror turns solid again. Fleeing again from MP, they try to escape on the bottomless canoe ride, but fail. Returning to shore, they are met by the girl and boy Jillian saw earlier, Lizzie and Luke Morris. They tell the VSPs that they believe they are safer in Horrorland, and when Jillian reads their minds, she says that Lizzie is lying. The VSPs demand to know what the Morris kids are up to. Slappy, thank you so much for talking to us today. It's my pleasure. It's so nice to be here on Horrorland TV. There's nowhere else. I'd rather be than with you. <laughs> well, that is nice to hear. We've been wanting to talk to you for a long time, but you are a busy dummy. I mean, man, boy. Please, call me a dummy. That's what I call you. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you tell me a little bit about Horrorland? Sure. Horrorland is a really wonderful, charming, inviting place for kids of all ages to come and have some fun. You know, it's been rumored that there are some menacing things happening there. No, really? Menacing things? I simply can't imagine. <laughs> like what? We hear that some of the rides are actually quite dangerous, and that some of the Horrorland staff is really up to no good. What? <laughs> Never. Please believe me, this is not at all the truth. The Horrorland staff has a scary, I mean a strict code of conduct, why they go through months of torture. I mean training. Hmm. I give you my word. <laughs> Let's shake on it. Ow, that hurt! Oh, did it! <sighs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay, Slappy. Many would say you've got some anger issues. Where does that anger stem from? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Is there something on my... Wait, what are you... <laughs> now from here, the last two books are going to be nothing but Horrorland plot advancement. No more Goosebump story taking up the spotlight. We're in the finale now, so I'm going to go in depth. Brace yourselves, the ride's only just begun. Significantly darker than I remembered, the Tunnel of Hate is actually really uncomfortable to read through. Also, we finally broke the age curse! The string of 12-year-olds has ended! 9 out of 10. Lizzie and Luke Morris, now 13 and 11, returned to Horrorland one year after their own adventure there. A few months ago, a horror by the codename of Monster X began sending them emails, warning them that something was going on in the park. A group of kids invited to Horrorland as very special guests who were in grave danger. They began to do their own research and started a blog, which we will touch on later in the video. The siblings had come to warn them that Panic Park was not what they thought it was, and that the remaining VSPs should stay in Horrorland. As Lizzie argues with the VSPs, Byron appears to hurry them all away to somewhere safe. Taking them inside a building only accessible with Matt's Panic Park keycard, the group is abandoned by Byron as they enter the now-abandoned Hall of Mirrors. With all of the VSPs hurrying through them, Luke and Lizzie follow by entering mirrors of their own to join the group in Panic Park. Arriving in Panic Park, the group can already tell that something is off. There is no sign of the previous eight kids who escaped here, and there are no colors in this place besides themselves. Everything is, quite literally, in shades of grey. 
Even the people are this way, and when Lizzie tries asking a young girl if she's seen their friends, the girl repeats the words, I vanished, and can you find me, over and over again. Lizzie tries to touch her, and her hand phases right through the girl. All of the park's residents are shades. Running away, Robbie finds a newspaper article that claims Panic Park was shut down forever after a series of accidents that killed multiple park goers, dating to July 12th, 1974. Going to an information booth, the dummy at the stand screams that the park is closed as worms fall out of its orifices, but Matt manages to find a park map. Wanting to check the carousel for any signs of Brittany or Molly, the group stumbles upon a mountain with Billy and Sheena stuck on its peak. After being unable to climb the mountain and getting scared by a fake landslide, Jackson uses his powers to pull the deeps back to the ground. They explain that they got separated from the others in the Tunnel of Hate, so the group heads there, and begins what may be the darkest section of this entire arc. As they boat through the Tunnel of Hate, its influence sweeps over them. The kids begin arguing, calling each other names, and soon, physical violence breaks out, hitting, punching, beating each other with the canoe paddles. Carly, Beth, and Julie get so abusive against one another, they actually fall out of their boat and start sinking to the bottom of the river, forcing Lizzie to drag Luke with her and get the other two back to the surface as they were too busy strangling one another to care about resurfacing. Continuing down the tunnel, the group finally encounters the stuck canoe of the remaining six kids. But as they've spent so much time in the tunnel, they have turned into feral beasts, choking and spitting and clawing at the other kids when they try to move the boat. Jackson uses his powers again to freeze the feral kids long enough to get their canoe to the front of the line and start paddling, pushing all 16 kids out of the tunnel of hate and back to their normal selves. Carly, Beth, and Julie thank Lizzie for saving them, to Jillian's dismay. Being the longest ones in the park, everyone asks Brittany and Molly what things are like here, but they can't recall anything specific, as they both feel as though they're in a fog. Just then, Byron appears and apologizes for bringing them here, claiming that he was fooled as well. When he offers them a way back to Horrorland, Jillian tries to read his mind and claims that he is telling the truth. Byron leads the group to the Midnight Maze and tells them that the only exit to Panic Park is at the other end of the maze. Heading through, the group gets caught in quicksand, before running into the same monster eggs Michael encountered back home. As they hatch, Michael knows there is only one thing to be done, and partakes of the yoke to transform himself once again. He fights and kills the other monsters, before eating more yolk and turning back to his human self. Continuing on, the Haunted Mask and its friends attack as well, forcing Carly Beth to also give in temporarily to destroy the other masks. But when there is no symbol of love around for her to remove the mask, Carly Beth goes wild and begins choking Sabrina. In a moment of freedom, Sabrina grabs her friend's face and kisses the cheek of the Haunted Mask, petting her head and soothing her until she can rip the Haunted Mask off and toss it away. Finally, coming across a lake, the group are captured by Long Ben One Leg and his crew before being forced to walk the plank into the icy cold lake water. Being the last one to go, Lizzie can't find any of the others around her before being sucked into the depths of the lake and being spat out on the opposite shore with the others. The group then sees a group of horrors and a banner saying, Welcome to Horrorland on a brick wall just ahead, but Lizzie quickly notices something. The horrors are in color, but the rest of the world around them is not. When the horrors approach to capture them, saying that the sign was his idea of a joke, Matt demands to know what they plan to do with them and asks Jillian to read their minds. When she says she can't because they are horrors, Lizzie immediately calls her out on her previous lie, saying that she could read Byron's mind before the maze. Jillian's cheeks flush red as she tries to stammer out an answer, but before she can, a new figure in all black with a hidden face approaches, goading Lizzie on to fight and hurt Jillian in retaliation. When she doesn't, the figure introduces himself as Karloff Menace, or rather, THE Menace, and the original owner 
of Panic Park. He tells them that he needs a favor for them to stay in Panic Park forever. Pretty decent and grisly in some places for a finale. It was sad that they didn't use the carousel for the plot, but it's whatever. 8 out of 10. Now captured and brought to the Menace's castle lair, he begins to monologue to them, taunting the kids to continue fighting with one another before revealing something. Jillian and Jackson were working for him, and that he was the one who gave them their powers. Though they deny it, entirely confused, the twins are led away by some shades. When Billy tries to make a run for it, the shades cover him and turn him into one of them. As the menace keeps demonstrating his authority, he orders one shade to go get a trophy. When the shade moves too slowly, the menace sucks the entire poor soul into a vacuum, erasing it forever. Another shade gets the trophy. Jillian's head. The menace tosses it at the group, and Robbie catches it, realizing it's a fake. Then the shades surround the kids and clamp metal bracelets on each of them. The Menace explains that he specifically chose this group of kids to invite to Horrorland and then bring to Panic Park because they have each dealt with terrifying situations in the past and will be able to withstand the horrific trials he plans to put them through. He needs the energy of their fear to return Panic Park back to Earth and that the bracelets will read and collect that fear, storing it in the fear meter, which is then produced by none other than Byron. The horror has been leading them along the whole time, tempting them to escape Horrorland to get them to his master's realm. They are also told that trying to remove the bracelets will burn them into their skin. When another voice is heard, the menace's head turns around to reveal another face on the back of his head. The menace goes on to say that the kids will help him return Panic Park to Earth by getting the fear meter to 100 before dropping the floor out beneath them. Ending up in a movie theater with furry living seats, the kids are forced to watch reels of Panic Park from 1974 and experience the horrific sensations of each clip, as the menace explains the park's history. After a multitude of deaths on several rides, including the roller coaster, Tower to Nowhere, and the Whirlwind, the menace was forced to shut down the park. And as the place was a site for his experiments in terror, the fear level was so high that the park and its residents were sent hurtling into another reality, detached from space and time, stuck in 1974. At first, the menace enjoyed this new freedom. It gave him time for more experiments, causing the remaining guests to quickly become shadows. But eventually, he longed to return home. The Menace quickly discovered that he could use mirrors to travel back and forth between the two parks, as Horrorland had been built on the exact same spot where Panic Park once rested. However, during an experiment with a two-way mirror, the Menace developed a second face on his head. Byron leads the group out and through the castle to a room for them, before demanding Matt's keycard back. When he refuses, Byron starts shaking and tossing and throwing the boy around relentlessly until Matt hands it over and Byron just rips it in half in front of them before leaving. When the group decides to try and find their own way out, they find that the door was unlocked. Escaping down a tight elevator that only opens from the keycard, which Matt had saved by giving Byron his library card, the group wanders the park. Carly Beth tries to comfort the Shadow Girl from before, but when a bunch of them smother her, she comes out of the pile as another shade like Billy. Robbie then recalls that Brittany and Molly got out of the park once and tried to bring him with them, but all they can recall is that they entered a white building and that it was very windy. Going into the first white building they see, it's a doctor's office. For Dr. Maniac. He forces them outside and leads them to the Shake Shack, where inside he pulls a lever that violently shakes the whole building, to the point that Lizzie is knocked unconscious and afterwards Abby and Julie can't stop trembling. When Robbie threatens to erase Maniac, the mad villain pulls out a massive paintbrush and sweeps it over Robbie, turning him invisible. After he leaves, the group moves on and comes across a small chapel. Inside are the pictures of many other kids, all labeled with the letters FTD, Frightened to Death, 
previous test subjects for the Menace's fear meter experiment that all died when the meter hit 100. Moving along, they find themselves back at the Hall of Mirrors, but Lizzie finds out the hard way that the mirrors are solid. Suddenly, they are locked inside, and each of the villains from the kids' pasts appear in the mirrors to scare them. When Slappy appears, Brittany screams at him, and Slappy turns her head into that of a wooden puppet, pushing the fear meter to 80. And when Michael threatens the menace, he gives the young boy a monster face on the back of his head. Exiting the Hall of Mirrors, the group finds the villains all standing before them, approaching and needing their help, begrudgingly so. Cranium explains that he read the menace's mind just now, and learned that he intends on keeping everyone trapped in Panic Park afterwards. As the menace is only measuring the fear of the kids, they need to confront him and show him that they have no fear anymore, reducing the fear meter and taking away the menace's power until he and Panic Park shrink and fade away altogether. Leading the group back to the castle, Cranium lets them in and the group makes their way to the menace's study. Pushing their way inside past Byron, they chant no fear, but it has no effect. Turning to his computer, the menace reprograms the world and starts making worms appear all over the kids, in their hair, ears, and mouths. Just as the fear meter reaches 99, Lizzie remembers an old joke about worms and comes up with one last plan. She tells the joke to Luke, and it makes him laugh, halting the meter's advance. They start tossing around more jokes, and as the kids laugh, the meter drops. The menace screams at them, warning that if it hits zero, then not only will he and the park disappear, but so will all of them. The villains then burst in, and Slappy begins making more rude jokes, causing more laughter and making the room and the menace shrink, even making the second face melt away like candle wax. As the world around them begins to fall, the group and villains race for the whirlwind, the only way out of Panic Park now. Cranium reminds Brittany and Molly of how they used it once, and explains that the menace was trying to scare them away from it in the theater. However, the gate is padlocked, and Cranium cannot open it with his mind. Luckily, Jillian and Jackson appear, explaining that the menace had gained control over them during Cranium's tests at the Institute, but now, with the menace's power depleted, they were free. Jackson proves it by working with Cranium to unlock the gate, and everyone runs into the whirlwind. Looking behind her as she is pulled into the hurricane and tossed through the air, Lizzie sees the park continuing to shrink, along with Byron and Karloff, getting smaller and smaller until it pops like a bubble. After a while, Lizzie finds herself landing softly on pavement. She and all the others had returned to the Horrorland parking lot, and everyone was back to normal. All of the parents emerge as well, stating that they had been taken to a separate hotel with one another and had a great time. Heading back home finally, Lizzie thinks back on seeing Panic Park disappear forever as she opens her suitcase and finds Slappy inside, having followed her home to start a whole new story that'll really give her goosebumps. In addition, there was one side book released called Welcome to Horrorland, A Survival Guide. This is essentially a guidebook on everything you can find in Horrorland, like actual brochures and pamphlet stuff, with notes from Luke and Lizzie added in throughout. This book beat any enjoyment for puns I might have had out of me, like a dusty mat at spring cleaning. It is just loaded with every cheesy, goofy horror pun you can think of. But it is a fun read. Now, I'm still going to go over arcs 2 and 3, though not in nearly as much detail because, well, arc 1 was the true story and these continuations felt kind of unnecessary, just extending the series beyond what it needed to be. The second arc of Horland revolved around a gift shop called Chiller House, run by a strange elderly man named Jonathan Chiller, and except for the final installment, every single book followed the same plot structure. 
It starts with the main kid already in Horrorland, having some kind of frightening encounter with a horror worker or actor, before ending up in the gift shop. They find a gift that piques their interest, and Schiller lets them take it home for free, saying that they can pay him back later. Then the gift leads to some kind of Goosebumps adventure, and once that is finished, the kid is teleported back to Chiller House so that they can pay up. The books included in this arc are When the Ghost Dog Howls, Little Shop of Hamsters, Heads You Lose, Weirdo Halloween, The Wizard of Ooze, Slappy New Year, and The Horror at Chiller House. The only non-finale book to kind of break from this structure is Weirdo Halloween, a Goosebumps special edition which is simultaneously one of the most annoying Goosebumps adventures and also one of the better Horrorland stories. I'll give a brief summary on it. The main character Meg takes home a small alien doll and then has to deal with a real alien named Bin who makes her life a living hell. As this is the Halloween special edition, when we get to the halfway point in the book, Meg's adventure ends and she is teleported to Horrorland. Since it's Halloween, Horrorland's most important time of year, Chiller wants to play a game with her. Double or nothing. The only objective is to prove to him that she is herself. While at first this is confusing, eventually Meg encounters her brother Chris and a clone of herself, and has trouble proving her identity. In the end, it's revealed that the other her and Chris were both robots made by Chiller, and he sends her home, where another Meg is already in her room. The final book, The Horror at Chiller House, brings everything together for Chiller's final act. The story opens with a lengthy flashback to 1960, where a young Jonathan spends his days locked away studying in his room, as his mother believes that he has a special brain, and his father believes him a freak. He is a lonely child with no friends, and instead has to make his own fun and games when he can. When his father finally decides to try and make him a man by taking the boy hunting, Jonathan shoots himself in the foot with a crossbow. Hearing his father outside of his bedroom door proclaim that he gives up on his son, Jonathan flies into a rage, lining up his toys and demanding that they all obey him, Jonathan Chiller. Jumping forward to current day, Chiller has brought these kids together to play another one of his games. The goal for the kids is to find the tiny horror idols that Chiller gave to them to transport them back to Horrorland, and all the while, Chiller and his group of hunters will be literally hunting them down. The kids head out, seeking helpers to aid their cause, but in the end it's revealed that not only were all of the helpers actually hunters, both groups being made up of the characters that brought the kids to Chiller House initially, but that Chiller was playing the role of all of those characters using disguises. Chiller wanted to prove that he could be a great hunter like his father, but the kids are done playing his game, something Chiller refuses to let happen, and thus won't let them go home. So. They each take a mask of one of the characters and put them on, dancing around Chiller and claiming they are leaving him, being taunted with his only friends that he made up, abandoning him, Chiller freaks out and gives the kids the idols to return home, finally surrendering. And then in the epilogue it's hinted that Chiller is just restarting the whole plan over again. The overall problem with Chiller arc is that there wasn't any real advancement of the mystery until the final book, where everything got spilled out at once. Compare that to arc 1, where each book added more characters and introduced new pieces of the mystery constantly. Why are there no mirrors in Horrorland? Why is Byron telling the kids to escape? What's the deal with Matt's keycard? Etc, etc. Though I did enjoy the extension with Weirdo Halloween to give us basically two full adventures in one book. In all honesty, this should probably be called Arc 2.5. I didn't even bother rereading these because I don't consider them true Horrorland, and neither does its own series. See, I have this particular printing of the first entry in Hall of Horrors, and this was the title banner. And this is the title banner for every entry afterwards, including future printings of this book. Notice anything different? Hall of Horrors was the most obvious milking of the Horrorland name. You, you want to know what the connection to Horrorland is for these six books? There's a secret Hall of Horrors in some secret, shadowy corner of Horrorland that no one visits except those with scary stories to tell. In the dark. A. This is literally Tales from the Crypt. Each book starts and ends with a two-page scroll from the Story Keeper as he introduces and concludes each kid's story and then the rest of the book is a normal Goosebumps story. 
That's it. No overarching plot line, nothing. Just using the name for recognition's sake. After this, Stein moved on to the Most Wanted series, and that was the end of Horrorland for the most part. Don't go just yet. We still have a few more things to discuss. Now, if you were an active fan of the Horrorland series during its publishing period, you probably remember the website that came with it. Enter Horrorland was a flash game website that you could log on to, no book purchase necessary, and play mini games that spanned across Horrorland's length. With each book's release came a new portion of the Horrorland map to play with, where you would tangentially follow in the footsteps of the main characters, visit the same places they did, and face off against their villains for the most part. Madame Doom acted as your guide, explaining events and telling you where to go as you fought back against the Horrorland big bads. So for example, with the release of Revenge of the Living Dummy, since the Enter Horrorland section of that book took place primarily around the Stagger Inn and dealt with Slappy, on the website, you would go to the Stagger Inn, complete some games, and then face off against Slappy. You actually had to fight Slappy three times over the course of the website, maps 1, 4, and 12. Actually, map 4, it was Slappy wearing the haunted mask, which is an absolutely terrifying concept. But luckily, he's susceptible to slingshots. I remember the monster cafe in map 3, where everyone would make their own monsters, and yet something like Egg would just be the perpetually highest voted creature every day. And what I wouldn't give to listen to that final boss theme on map 12 again. Ugh. The electric guitar version of the site's main theme, followed by the music box tune in the Hall of Mirrors as you force Slappy into Panic Park, and then the final victory theme with the cheering and fireworks. God, I miss those songs so much. Which is why, if you ever played on EnterHorland.com before it was closed in 2014 and still have that computer lying around, please go check your browser's caches and see if you have any Horland data in there. And if you do, go give it to the people in the Discord I'm going to link in the description below. This group is dedicated to rebuilding the site for offline Flash browsers, and have only managed to rebuild some parts of it, so any data is of great help. And plus, you can join and relive the site. Now, most people remember this site, but there was actually a second site as well. Escape Horrorland was a blog that was supposedly run by Luke and Lizzie Morris, and shared their findings as they investigated Horrorland before Book 10. It wasn't updated super often, but it did exist, so I figured it was worth mentioning. And lastly, there was the Goosebumps Horrorland video game. Now, there was a computer game in the 90s called Escape from Horrorland, but this was a new release that came out alongside the novels. My own personal journey to find a copy of this game for the DS took years, well after the series had concluded. I found it in a used games bin and pleaded with my mother to get it for me, since I knew I was never going to see it again if I didn't grab it then. Thankfully, she got it for me, and I played through it in a single day. The game is fine. In all honesty, it could probably be considered shovelware, but I still enjoyed it. It bears no continuity to the books at all, and just features a nameless protagonist wandering Horrorland after being invited to its grand opening. Once inside, the only way to leave is to collect the missing pieces of your ripped up ticket across the park, and the only way to progress is to collect enough frights from each minigame and ride to meet the next zone's fright restriction. The big plot twist comes from saving a young girl named Gigi from the roller coaster in Vampire Village, who is revealed to be the Great Gargantua, a massive demon who you end up helping escape Horrorland before she reveals herself to you. It's fun, albeit a little cheap. Bumper Carnage is the best game. Horrorland was something I've wanted to revisit for a good number of years now, and now I can rest easy in my grave having done so. And I hope that this ride down memory lane has been enjoyable for you as well. Please watch your elbows and knees as you exit the vehicle. Be sure to like and subscribe for more stuff like this in the future. And thank you for watching, as well as for 4,000 subs. We hope to see you again soon. Get out of here!